Okay, so I'd like to present our next presenter. It is Molly Hancock, the Vice President of Programs at Fair Start, and she is committed to empowering homeless and disadvantaged men and women to transform their lives through culinary job training. So thank you, Molly, and take it away. All right, thank you so much, Jimmy, and thank you, Caleb. That was really informative. Every time I get to hear you, I learn something new, so I really appreciate that. So I am Molly Hancock at Fair Start, and um, I, for those of you who are um, on the line, you are probably have familiar, some familiarity with us already through your work with Catalyst Kitchens. Um, but we actually work, um, like all of you, um, in, uh, to provide job training and life skill training to disadvantaged young people, women and men. And we do that via our social enterprises with a focus around food. And so um, we kind of look at this as our flywheel. And uh, we are really excited to talk to you today about SNAP ENT because it has been uh, tremendous for us in terms of growth. So, just kind of a quick review first of our programs and what we do. We, um, and I'm sorry, you can tell that um, I'm better at um, maybe programs than I am at PowerPoints, but um, here's kind of an overview of our programs. Um, so I'm focused on Fair Shorts programs in the Puget Sound region. We also obviously are part of Catalyst Kitchens, and um, Catalyst Kitchens is, um, is part of our umbrella organization but this is specific to what we do here at Fair Start. So um, you are probably very familiar with our adult culinary training program. We just added a new adult apprenticeship program, um, started actually last month. So the adult culinary training program is um, a 16-week competency-based um, applied skills learning program and we get SNAP funding for that. Um, and then after our graduates have gone out into the workforce in the community and are ready to take the next level of skilling up, they can enter our apprenticeship program. Both of those programs are open to adults 18 and over. The requirements for apprenticeship are, um, are more stringent because it's a career development program, and so we are looking at apprentices for that program who have, um, have historical barriers to employment but have already found some success in employment and are ready to advance their careers. We also operate uh, two youth training programs. Um, one is a youth culinary program that is our newer youth program and that's in association with um, the alternative um, kind of programming for Seattle Public Schools called Interagency Academy and we provide job uh, development life skill and job development training for young people who are age 16 to 20 who um, generally speaking have previously been expelled from, dropped out of, or otherwise have become disengaged from um, the school system, don't have a credential and don't have a job and have found their way back um, into re-engaging in education through uh, Interagency Academy. We also have uh, youth Barista Training Program that primarily serves street involved homeless youth ages 16 to 24. So those are really the programs, the four programs that we're using um, for SNAP ENT dollars to support. We also, um, as I know you know, um, provide a, meals to our community, to people in need. This year we'll provide about a million meals to um, kids in Head Start programs and in schools and low-income daycares and uh, to shelters across our region. And then we have retail businesses that are social enterprises, um, both our school and community meals, um, social enterprise, and our restaurants, our cafes, and our catering social enterprises are all geared at providing job opportunities um, and job training opportunities primarily for the individuals that we serve. And then, of course, um, we've had this wonderful opportunity with Catalyst Kitchens to be able to work across the country um, with multiple members and learn from multiple members. So how does the SNAP money work for us in Washington? Um, so uh, I'm, I, uh, th this is not a political discussion, but um, yay for the Farm Bill and yay for people who actually led the work to make sure that SNAP ENT was included in this last round of the Farm Bill because uh, that funding is critical to support people in their journey to self-sufficiency. And in Washington, um, we, uh, that money comes from the Farm Bill funding, comes through Food Nutrition Services, um, and so 
SNAP gets funded, ENT gets funded, and then that money comes to our state. We're uh, in Washington very fortunate since 2007 to have our Department of Social and Health Services um, with the foresight and the belief that um, there was an opportunity to use SNAP funding and the ENT funding to support people in moving towards economic self-sufficiency. And so DSHS is the abbreviation for that department in our state. And there were visionary leaders in 2007 who really said, wow, these funds are becoming available through the federal government. How can we make a difference for people in our state uh, in terms of moving them um, further up the economic ladder. So, um, so DSHS is kind of the receiving intermediary for us in Washington. And as Kayla said, different states have different rules. We have very, since we, you know, in Washington been, um, had SNAP, a SNAP ENT program since 2007. It's pretty developed and pretty advanced. And um, we have pretty great information in terms of handbooks and also technical support at the state level. So. Um, we have a fairly advanced program. I know some other states, particularly California and CalFresh, are really just rethinking and, you know, resetting their programs. So, um, so you know, again, it is super important to understand what happens in your state. But for us, we actually um, apply to the Department of Social and Health Services every year for um, fiscal year 2018. We submitted our um, budget requests and our program requests at the beginning of June. And as Kayla said, those are in review now at the federal level. But, um, but that's how the calendar works for us. So we're coming in at the beginning of June, submitting a budget for the upcoming year. And we are also, um, and we are also it, it depends, we may submit an entirely new program proposal as well. So um, we are waiting now to hear how we'll be funded in FFY18. Meanwhile, though, um, you know, we, we are still obviously in FFY17, and we're working with 50-50 funds that we received um, from Department of Social and Health Services to fund our programs. And um, in Washington, we've had this um, great opportunity the last couple of years uh, to go back and during the course of the year as the program's meeting its, um, its projected numbers, the program's we're able to go back and ask the state for more money at a few intervals if other um, community-based organizations or community colleges are not spending their funds. So we have had the opportunity to get our initial contracts the last couple, few years and also get additional funding through the course of the year. And so um, that's pretty amazing because I can't think of any other grant where that's possible. Um, so then we leverage, you know, we receive and we leverage our 50-50 basic food employment and training funds to support job training and job placement programs. And I want to talk to you a little bit about how we use those because um, the, we um, have found this funding to be incredibly flexible. Um, so for us, we are funding our uh, training programs um, and the four programs I, I mentioned, as long as you're SNAP eligible, unless you're a TANF mom or dad, um, you are eligible for uh, SNAP ENT funding. We're different than um, many of our partner CBOs because we will enroll students in any of our programs who are qualified for the programs based on um, being in poverty and based on their barriers to employment and their willingness and readiness to be ready for job training and to work whether or not they qualify for SNAP ENT. So, um, so we're a little different, and our social enterprise revenue, as well as our private funding, allows us to do that. So um, that means that of everybody we enroll, only somewhere around 85% are actually be SNAP eligible. Generally, for us, the people who are not SNAP eligible or ENT eligible are TANF parents. They're also federal assistance program participants. And um, we also serve individuals who are in work release, which if you're in work release, you are considered to be still incarcerated. I say technically because you're actually out in the community. But um, you're considered to be incarcerated. You're not eligible for SNAP funds at that point. You're not eligible for SNAP benefits. Therefore, you're not eligible for SNAP ENT. So those are some of the reasons that somebody who is qualified for and wants to be in one of our programs might not be able to get SNAP funding. 
as a result of both the, the things that the state will fund and the state and also the fact that we're willing to enroll people who aren't eligible for uh, ENT support, we get about a third of our program funds from SNAP ENT. So it's really important to us. It's it's hugely important and um, and it's allowed us to expand. So um, since 2008, we have well more than doubled our capacity at Fair Start to serve people who are in need. And the funding um, that we've received has been critical to allow us to do that. We use that funding, as I mentioned, um, for job training. But I also want to talk a little bit about how flexible the funding is to support participant needs. Because for us at Fair Start, about nearly 85% of the individuals we enroll are literally homeless at the time they come to us. And that includes young people living on the streets, um, young people who have lost housing with their family of origin, adults who um, are in reentry from incarceration, um, people through adverse economic circumstances that wound up on the street. And in Seattle, um, we're in the hottest real estate market in the country right now. Um, and a one-bedroom apartment now costs about $1,900 a month in Seattle. Uh, it is extremely difficult for people to actually pay for housing. And so as a result of that, we are seeing galloping rates of unemployment in the Northwest, even as the economy is booming. So um, we have people coming to us who have tremendous need. And so we've been able to use SNAP ENT funding at Fair Start for emergency housing, for up to two months of emergency housing for our participants. And that is um, critical for people who are literally homeless because it's, it's virtually impossible to show up for a job training program, be responsible and accountable to that program, and be here in the morning at 8 a.m. showered and in your uniform if you literally slept um, under a tree in the park last night. And uh, so we are really grateful for that opportunity. We also use SNAP funds to pay for transportation, which is critical for both job training and um, job search and then initial job retention. And we use funds to pay for training materials and training costs and some certifications like health cards or um, food safety certifications, as well as professional knife kits for our students. So, um, so it's really been great to be able to use that kind of um, a realm of funding. So to date at Fair Start, we've received over $7 million in 50-50 SNAP ENT funding, but um, this year, we will get about $1.4 million in SNAP ENT funding. So you can see that if you just look at the trajectory, we've continued to be able to increase the use of our 50-50 funds. And again, you know, I'm going to make the point about matching. We match with social enterprise revenue, and we match with corporate and private foundation and individual contributions um, to cover the rest of the cost of programs. We've enrolled over 2,000 individuals in SNAP supported training programs since we started working with our state ENT program. Um, I mentioned the homelessness rate of the individuals we're serving and why the flexibility of the funds are so important for us. We have a really great success rate. Over 90% of our students will engage, will gain employment within 90 days. And this year, we've added, uh, we started with our adult culinary program only as a SNAP funded program. Three years ago, we added our youth barista program. Two years ago, we added our youth culinary program. And this year, we've added our adult apprenticeship program for those who are SNAP qualified and so um, benefit qualified. So it's been critical. And I, you know, probably when I say over 200% capacity growth, actually in our SNAP programs, we've had, can I do that math? 400% growth in programs, thanks to the funding. So um, that's kind of the impact for us. Um, you know, Kayla said, find out what your state does or if it's your county. And I would say my advice is make those people your best friend because uh, they, at least in our state, not only provide us support and assistance, but they've also created a broad study of practice basically across the state with all the community based organizations and community, ba community colleges. And so we have a really um, diverse and robust community of people who are involved in employment training as a result of being part of the SNAP funding. And we also are able to get uh, assistance from the state to problem solve. So it's really um, great for us. So I'm going to stop there and see if there are any questions. Thank you so much for that great presentation, Molly. Um, 
Again, if you have a question, you can uh, actually I'll let you also click on the raise hand uh, option in the top uh, left hand corner of your screen or you can type it into the chat box in the lower left hand corner. Um, for now actually we'd like to hear from you while we wait for to see if there's any questions. I'm going to ask uh, all the attendees and the presenters you can um, answer as well. Um, Hi Jimmy, uh, this yes. is Emily. I actually have a question for Molly. Okay great, yes that's the way. Um, so Molly, I'm wondering if there was anything about the training programs at Fair Start that we had to change in order to receive that funding. Were there any adaptations or changes that had to be made that are notable to you in order to be eligible? Yeah, that's a really um, fascinating question, Emily, because there are kind of two parts to the ENT funding we currently get. We get our the ENT funding we've received since 2008. Basically, although that's morphed and changed, um, it has really been in support of the programs that we operate. We also are part of a pilot project that in Washington is called RISE that is focused on work registrants and um, working with the highest need work registrants to see if um, additional support through more ca more intensive case management and other supports uh, and work-based learning will um, support people in moving um, forward with their lives. And so for the majority of our programming, uh, I would say the answer to that is not in terms of the programming, though when we did um, the RISE pilot, that's what's called in Washington State, we did take our life skills program and add additional components uh, that we call, that was called Washington Strategies for Success. So that was the one change we made. We um, have a fairly um, strong point of view about uh, creating programming and um, and working with programming and improving it to best serve the people that we serve, and not to do it because there is a funder who says here's a rule or here's something I expect. So we. Um, we are pretty firm about that, but when we see opportunities like we did with Strategies for Success, we say, oh wow, you know, in that pilot this is something that we wanted to test. We wanted to test um, more case management uh, at this juncture, and we've also wanted to test additional life skills training. So we're actually going to, that's a great marriage for what we want to see with the pilot. Um, but the one thing I would add is it's not, um, <laughs> This is not about how we change a program, but you know the the requirements in terms of tracking and uh, inputting information into the state database um, have continued to accelerate. And so, well, it doesn't change the programming so much; it does change the activity required to ensure that we're in compliance and that we are um, that we are meeting the the requirements of the state and the federal government with the grant. So that that is one thing I would say that has definitely changed over the last few years. Okay, Molly, I actually have a question now. This is Jimmy from the USDA. Can you talk about how the Youth Barista program came about and um, kind of how Fair Start brainstorms and tries out new ideas uh, like I think the Youth Barista program might have been uh, like in a, yeah. came about in a brainstorming pro, um, session or something. Well it did, but I um, actually, can I talk about the Youth Culinary Program because that's the most, uh, a more recent one and I think it's a really good illustration, Jimmy, of that. Is that alright? Yeah, you? that's fine. Awesome. So our Youth Culinary Program is now just two years old and um, first of all, you know, we always start with a community needs assessment and say, where are we seeing uh, individuals being underserved? And for our strategic plan, we had made a commitment when we'd done our due diligence in the community needs assessment. We understood that young people, particularly young people who are age 16 to 24, who are in poverty, who for the most part tended to be uh, in the south end of our county, and also um, tended to not have a high school credential or be uh, involved in employment and there are about 20 some thousand individuals, young people in this situation in our county. We could see that they were underserved with job training programs. So we, and we also had a high demand for a youth culinary program. So 
we actually went out and talked to all community-based organizations that we could find because we knew that we wanted to partner with somebody who could provide the support services and education, and we would provide the training, the job training, and on-the-job training, and job placement. So that's how we came to partner with Interagency Academy. We um, had engaged Seattle Public Schools as part of our due diligence when we wrote our strategic plan, our five-year plan, which we are in year four of. And so it was really easy to come back to them and say, you know, we see Interagency Academy serving about 1,100 kids a year in South King County, and we're, you know, how's that working for you guys? And they said, well, it would really work great if we had some more job development. And we said, that's awesome, because we're really trying to figure out how we can make a difference in that part of our community. And so we sat down together and we designed the program. And um, one really cool thing about it is that's an education and employment program. And of our young people who are in that program, their attendance goes while they're in the program from somewhere around average is 35 to 40 percent daily attendance at school to over 90 percent attendance. And our job placement rate is really high and our stickiness with education, because these kids need money, they're, they're in abject poverty. So they need to be in school and they need to be working. And um, we've been able to really successfully partner with employers to find appropriate part-time work for them. So that's how that came about. And um, we, uh, at the same time, talked to our, um, our, our support team at the Department of Social and Health Services and said, okay, this is a more complicated group to serve, um, really clean with adults, right, who are you know, single individuals, but with these kids, because they have all kinds of different family structures. And so the state helped us problem solve how we could get uh, these kids enrolled in ENT who are over 16 and able to work. And um, it's really been a great partnership. That's, that's incredible. That's great results. Um, thanks for sharing that, Molly. We actually have a question, it looks like, from Michael uh, Bozier. And uh, I'm going to unmute your line, and you can uh, ask your question, Michael. Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, my question is, we're in South King County, and I've been rubbing, running a barista and culinary program for at-risk youth for 10 years now. And the biggest uh, barrier is funding to get quality um, trainers into our, on, to build our capacity. What is the, is there any rule of thumb on why we're getting, having such a difficulty in getting funding for job training? Uh, I, you know, Michael, this is Molly, and I'm going to say since we're in the same county and obviously for DSHS, have you, I mean, also would ha you might have access to ENT, have you guys talked with the state, with the Department of Social and Health Services to see if you can get funded for um, BFET? No, um, really, we, we really haven't. I mean, we're in a process in three weeks, we're opening up a new store in Tukwila, which is a needed community as well. And... Um, you know, it's just been such a hard process. I mean, I've tried to apply for DVR, and that's a process. Again, when when we're faced with funding, um, it's just been hard for us. So, Emily, do you, um, since we've got Michael on the line, do we want to take this offline and see if we can give him some uh, support here? Yeah, that's what I would suggest, Michael. Um, if it's all right with you, maybe we can set up a separate time to talk about Washington State-specific uh, funding opportunities. Um, and we're happy to help coordinate some resources for you there. Um, does that sound all right to you? I can reach out later today to set up some time. Uh, that would be wonderful. And uh, thanks again for last week's uh, Northwest Summit. Uh, that was amazing. Oh, great. Yeah, it was so good to have you guys there. Um, OK, you will hear from me okay. later, and we can um, yes. Okay. Um, thank you for your question, Michael, and thank you, Emily and Molly, for uh, um, connecting with Michael later. 